I'm Brittany Harden Tangway, a manager with KPMG, and I am fascinated by the practice of transfer pricing and its impact on the global market. Join me each episode as I explore the transfer pricing world with specialists who will explain the ins and outs of this niche practice where tax meets economics. In previous episodes, we have talked about financial transactions and how they are not limited to the financial services industry. At some point, most multinationals will find themselves in a situation where they ought to consider a cross-border intercompany loan or some other type of financial transaction. While we've discussed this from a U.S. perspective, there's a whole world out there. The OECD transfer pricing guidelines are internationally accepted, particularly in the European Union. The topic of transfer pricing for financial transactions has become so prevalent that the OECD released an entire chapter, Chapter 10, titled Transfer Pricing Guidance on Financial Transactions in January of 2022, with the intention of providing more direction around how to consider these transactions. I have with me here today two of my colleagues from KPMG Netherlands, Janneke Versenfort from the Antoven office. Hello, good afternoon, Brittany. <laughs> Hello, thank you for joining us. And then Jaap Reinveld, a transfer pricing partner based out of Amsterdam. Hi, Brittany. Good afternoon. Would you give us just a bit of background on the OECD guidelines, specifically Chapter 10, what it is, why this is relevant, and how they align with your local Dutch law as a result? Well, the OECD guidelines are not directly incorporated in the Dutch legislation, only the arm's length principle. However, we have a Dutch transfer pricing decree, and this decree aims at explaining the application of the arm's length principle by the Dutch tax authorities. And because the Dutch tax authorities, they use the OC guidelines in their field of conducting audits, etc., they also adopt Chapter 10, and in their practice, they apply the guidance provided by Chapter 10 on financial transactions. But on the Dutch side, we have this Dutch transfer pricing decree in 2022, six months after the publication of uh, chapter 10 of the OC guidelines, a new version of the Dutch transfer pricing degree was released. And much of the new guidance in that degree concerns financial transactions. There's a whole chapter, chapter nine in the Dutch transfer pricing degree, or TP degree, which deals with those uh, transactions. And let me just name a few of the subjects that are being addressed in that degree. First, the characterization of a transaction not just looking at interest rates, but is a loan really considered to be a loan? When is it considered to be equity? Another topic was the allocation of interest income within the group where it is relevant to establish who exercises control over risks involved and who has the financial capacity to bear risk. The Dutch authorities endorse an approach whereby it could be that the interest income that ends up with one entity on a substance base based on the functions that control the risk ends up in another entity. Another topic, which is very specific in the Netherlands, relates to credit rating. The degree assumes that only in special cases, an independent lender will be willing to grant a loan to a borrower with a credit rating below triple B minus, so below investment grade. And as a result of that, in case we have a loan to a non-investment grade borrower, the taxpayer has to make it plausible that the transaction was agreed under arm's length conditions. However, the degree is not very explicit on how that should be done. Another remarkable point, which is not new in this version of the degree, is the degree requires that implicit support should be taken into account in determining the credit rating of a group company. We have guidance on cash pools, guarantees, captives. However, the most striking part of the degree is found in the guidance on financial services companies. The OECD guidelines, as we all know, are guidelines. So it's published guidance that taxpayers and tax authorities are encouraged to follow. However, each specific jurisdiction is required or is encouraged to have their own transfer pricing regulations that they follow. And so that's what this Dutch transfer pricing decree is. It's basically the Dutch specific interpretation that is law in the Netherlands. That's right, Brittany. The OCD guidelines are very much the Bible on transfer pricing for the Dutch authorities. But on certain topics, they have their own interpretation. And so the TP degree reflects that specific interpretation. Their views are not necessarily exactly in line with Dutch jurisprudence, Mm. but more in line with this substance-based approach in the OECD guidelines. Taxpayers can take their own positions, Mm -hmm. but they can rely on the TP degree if they follow it. So it's not mandatory, but it gives some comfort if you follow the guidance then you will have less discussion with the Dutch tax inspector. 
Thank you. That is a very important clarification for our listeners, because I know all of the different rules and interpretations around the world, it's always a little unclear where things stand, but that's a really wonderful way to wrap that up. So, Janneke, <laughs> would you talk about some of your experiences over the past year with interpreting the decree and the application? Yes, of course. The Netherlands is and was quite famous as jurisdiction for group treasury and financing activities, not only for a very large worldwide treaty network, but also for the access to capital markets, availability of qualified personnel, and a rather flexible corporate banking law. But with political pressure, especially in relation to aggressive tax planning, over the years the regime also for financial service companies was up for debate. In the 2022 TP degree, substance of financial service companies became more important. Also, the validation of the financial position of the company became more relevant with the requirements on financial capacity. The Netherlands nowadays still has some group treasury and financing companies. And these are predominantly involved in either direct or indirect in and on lending or licensing activities. We call that dienstverleningslichamen. And there is specific guidance for those entities in the Netherlands for the determination of the arm's length remuneration. And there also alignment with Chapter 10 of the OECD guidelines is sought. More specifically, if you look at allocation of risks to such financial service company, it's important to show that you have sufficient control over risks and that there is sufficient financial capacity to bear potential negative consequences if the risks are being materialized. In determining whether the service entity has sufficient financial capacity, it needs to be assessed to what extent the service entity would be able to attract debt from a third party on a standalone basis, so without a guarantee from an affiliated company. Funding that could only be obtained by the service entity due to guarantees by related parties would be regarded as effectively a loan to the guarantor, followed by an equity contribution by the guarantor to the borrower. Solely for the part of the loan that qualifies as a loan to the guaranteed party, an arm's length guarantee fee could potentially be charged. The new guidance in the TP degree in the Netherlands nevertheless mentions this recharacterization of the loan into equity, which would lead to non-deductible interest expenses at the level of the borrower. And from a Dutch tax perspective, a deemed dividend distribution. We always recommend to analyze whether these new rules may be applicable to you and also to analyze which route fits your tax strategy best. Further, the degree also makes a distinction between three different types of service companies. The first is a group financial service company that has both the full control over risk and the adequate financial capacity. There's some kind of in-house bank with full risk and equity in the Netherlands, typically Dutch multinationals with treasury centers in the Netherlands. Then another category group financial service entities that have no control over risk or insufficient financial capacity. And there is a third category of group financial service entities that have a shared control over risk with other group companies and have the financial capacity. But with respect to this guidance, categorization can be very challenging, especially if you look at the category three service company. That's the shared control. In practice, it's very difficult for us to provide concrete advice on the level of shared control. How much substance is needed to have shared control in the Netherlands? We recommend to document and substantiate the positions thoroughly by ways of a value chain analysis. Because there can be a negative impact on the category two and category three entities. So that's the cost plus and the shared control entities, such as foreign withholding tax substance, TP mismatches, exchange of information, timely and complete transfer pricing documentation is highly recommended for further substantiation of the positions. And in some cases, bilateral advanced pricing agreements or APAs or multilateral APAs or national APAs is a possibility. Janneke, if I can add to that, what we see in practice is that the Dutch authorities also have to find their way around how to explain this guidance. It's quite new for them. They have to see how they apply the guidance that's provided in the degree in practice. So that's why it's very important to prepare yourself well in case you have a financial service companies in the categories two or three, in particular three, on how you present it. And it's good to have that discussion with the Dutch authorities to obtain certainty in advance. 
Certainty. That's the theme around applying for APAs or advanced pricing agreements, because that's one tool that can achieve certainty among many others. And so um, I do want to take just a little bit of a step back and talk about DVLs or Janneke, would you say the term again? Because I don't think I could ever get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's Dienstverleningslichamen. It's Dutch for financial service companies. And this is part of why the Dutch Trencher Pricing Decree in response to or in addendum to the Chapter 10 guidelines are so important because this structure is a very common one for many multinationals. Would you give us a little bit of a background on that? A lot of multinational companies with their treasury activities in a specific company in order to manage the risk and all the financial transactions out of one entity and generally in one country or divided over regions. And historically, a lot of these companies were located in the Netherlands. So even if you would have U.S. multinationals, it was a very good possibility to have a treasury center in the Netherlands because of the treaty network, flexible banking law or a qualified personnel. And recently, that type of structure was up for debate because there were also multinationals that had empty postbox offices through which a lot of financial transactions went through without specific control over risk. That is also as a reaction to all the BEPS action plans or base erosion profit shifting action plans uh, to avoid these kind of structures. And therefore the Dutch tax authorities came with this specific guidance on financial service companies. In addition to what uh, Janneke says, this new categorization is inspired by the OCD guidelines based on this control over risk functionality. And if you compare that to a company with very light substance in a finance company in the Netherlands, that would be for the Dutch authorities a reason to see that this is not in agreement with the OCD guidelines. And that has been the reason why they make this categorization. If there's not sufficient substance in the Netherlands, if the control functions are not in the Netherlands, then the profit that belongs to that and the interest income that belongs to that should in principle not belong to the Netherlands. That spread is only reported in the Netherlands if that's in line with the functionality in the Dutch entity. And that's why, as Janneke mentioned, having a thorough value chain analysis is so important. Clearly, the talent, there's an economies of scale in the Netherlands yes. for providing these treasury services, but being able to substantiate that is critical in response to this most recent decree. Not only from a Dutch perspective, but also from a foreign source country perspective, because mm. not only the Dutch are looking at the transfer pricing, but also foreign tax authorities are looking at withholding tax and to see whether that Dutch treasury company is in fact the beneficial owner of the interest income. And then you can also prove with that value chain analysis that indeed the Netherlands is controlling the risk and is financially capable to actually assume the risk. And I think historically, there are a lot of treasury companies in the Netherlands. Therefore, it's important to look at it because maybe some of them are there without a lot of substance and well, not realizing that there are these risks. Rules and regulations change so much that it's hard to keep up. So thinking about what listeners and companies ought to be thinking about or what they ought to do to respond to this, especially as interpretations continue to clarify through experience. There's two main things that we should consider here. One is the control for risk functionality, which is very much emphasized in this new decree. And the other one is the ability to bear certain risks, to have an adequate capital. And those two things should be key in evaluating whether your finance company in the Netherlands, whether your finance transactions are still adequately addressed by way of a transfer pricing policy that you have in place. So what we typically recommend our clients is to look into what in their functionality with respect to those finance transactions. Where are certain risk functions performed that control the risks involved in those transactions? So we then recommend to do a core functional analysis Typically with those financing companies, there is a certain amount of functionality in the Netherlands, but there's also a treasury department outside the Netherlands. What are the, what are the responsibilities with respect to those transactions in the Netherlands and what is being done by the treasury company outside the Netherlands? The other one is a financial capacity. Are you able to, based on your financial capacity, attract funding, attract loans based on the equity that you have and the financial capacity that you have, or do you need to have a guarantee to obtain that funding? 
typically we do that by way of a debt capacity analysis or an equity at risk analysis. So I would say those are the two things to consider. I think it's very important for taxpayers to look at their risk appetite and be prepared for discussions and substantiate your position. We have seen in recent court cases that transfer pricing documentation is very important and that you have a much better position if you have your documentation in order. That's a great lesson. Sometimes people think about in the transfer pricing lifestyle, documentation as being like the routine checkup, but it's really important to make sure you do that. Do your functional interviews, make sure that you're representing all of that appropriately. And this just seems to be an additional reminder that that continues to be important, even with the new rules and regulations. Especially with the new rules and regulations, a fresh look is important because the rules in the Netherlands before this TP degree are very different. But nowadays, there's much more expected from taxpayers. So if you have transfer pricing documentation, please have a new fresh look at it in light of this new transfer pricing guidance. What we've seen in recent court cases where we see that transfer pricing becomes more and more a topic of court cases. If taxpayers have their documentation in place and have a good substantiated position, that helps them a lot to win the case. I don't think we can give better guidance than that. Well, thank you both so much. It's been lovely having you on. And as I explore transfer pricing around the world, getting all these different perspectives is particularly important. So thank you both for being such lovely guests. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Really a pleasure. Thanks for joining me on this adventure in transfer pricing. See you next time.